Hello and welcome to another episode of Literary Gladiators, the show where we discuss and debate literature in all of its forms. If it's written work, it's game. Let's meet the panel. I'm Tori. I'm Kayla. Hi, I'm Jesse. And I'm Josh. And today we are going to be going over a book that I personally am revisiting after 14 years. Uh, I was assigned to read this in a, uh, a summer program that I took part in uh, during, uh, and the, the theme of the, uh, the program was Around the World in 30 Days, mm -hmm. and our group, uh, we were talking about uh, European countries, and uh, because this book is German, uh, it uh, was the qualified and caught the interest of the uh, person instructing the class, and uh, that's a never-ending story by Michael N. Uh, this is a, uh, I would say, a modern classic in fantasy, even though it's only 40 years old. And while I was, uh, I was working out so many different ideas for discussion starters, uh, I thought that this would be the best one. What is Fantastica, and what is the never-ending story? What is Fantastica? Fantastica is our own imagination. It's our own imagination incarnate. It's any sort of whimsical idea that comes to life in anybody's sort of imagination, and it lives in this other world. That's how I kind of read it, so. That's actually, I kind of got the same thing, like Fantasca. <clears throat> and, I mean, reading the book, I felt like it just, it went in so many directions all at the same time, and I, I, I was and like, I can't follow it all, but, I okay. Like, I'm just gonna go with it. Like, eventually I stopped trying to understand it and just went with it um and i got the kind of the same thing it's like this is everyone's imagination this is how our brain um these are our dreams and our daydreams and that's everything that our minds kind of come up with and the never-ending story is just everybody's going to do it for all eternity it doesn't matter who you are you have something in your head that's just going to keep going and then when you're gone the next person behind you still has these these fantasies, these ideas, these mm. pictures Fantastica in their brain. Fantastica is the creative subconscious of the human race. And yes. then the never, under, never Ending Story is like the one specific kind of thread. thread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that thread that's being pulled from a tapestry that is so rich and, and you know... I mean, it has no borders. Color. Yeah, it, exactly. it is the Never Ending yeah. Story. Yeah. In I think that so. I'm going to build on to Tori's first. Uh, the fact that Fantastica is the imagination in the childlike... Uh, state of mind because a child like uh, the, the the state of uh, an undisrupted childhood state of mind has no boundaries mm -hmm. it's endless it's uh, undisturbed and uh, it's near and far it has it's everything it's everything it has yeah. that ability to uh, blossom into something spectacular and depending on who's the narrator, yes. that yeah. lens will color whatever mm -hmm. the world is looking at. at that point and that's why that's why the <clears throat> the ruler of the nation is a childlike empress. empress. Yeah. And I think it's mm -hmm. important. I was going to say the same thing. I think it's important to note that Fantastica, uh, it, not specifically, but especially, is the imagination of children because it mm -hmm. once. And I think it comes through as you're discussing the nothing. Um, but as you grow older, you lose the ability to visit Fantastica, you lose the ability to create that, such a, a rich, imaginative land, because you focus more on the real world. I do think that the never-ending story, though, uh, reminds us that there needs to be a sense of compromise. I think that on one hand, yeah, you, there are things that you should not be immersing yourself in, into its entirety, in the Fantastica. But I still feel that everybody needs that sense of Fantastica in order to, uh, in order to function, or in order to, in order for this to be uh, a better place. Because imagination should be encouraged even beyond the uh, childlike state. But and I think that's it's what this weighing book, it out. Yeah, I think that's what this book. It kind of almost champions is mm -hmm. the fact that just because you are a child doesn't necessarily mean that you need to stop being imaginative. Mm -hmm. um, it's saying that, you know, if you let apathy take over, if you let yourself become unimaginative and kind of uh, follow in with everybody else in shallow thinking, like, 
the nothing the nothing will start taking over and everything will start to become nondescript and what i thought was very interesting was that the um citizens of fantastica when they cross over if they end up in the nothing they turn into lies they turn into that negative um, mm. mischievous, malevolent side of fiction, mm -hmm. of, of spinning of imagination, of, of imagination yeah. gone mm -hmm. in a, used for a malicious way mm -hmm. and used in a selfish way. And I think that's the other thing that this book um, kind of highlights is not only be imaginative, but be use it correctly. Yeah, mm -hmm. use it in a yeah. benevolent way, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. um, is that everybody's story <coughs> is important no matter who you are. Um, and something that really tickled me was the the way that it was described. Um, Bastion, that's his name, mm -hmm. right? Bastion <laughs> Balthasar Bucks. Bucks. Ba uh, um, Bal yeah, Balthasar. Yeah, Bastion Balthasar Bucks. Yeah, there's this one description of him reading the book and how he becomes so enamored in the book, mm -hmm. and how somebody somewhere might be able to be enamored. I'm not gonna lie, I got tingles reading that because that's me. You know, the, yes. I was that kid. Uh, yeah, who, I think we all, anybody up here or anybody absolutely. watching these videos mm -hmm. can can attest to that. Like. You had to be able to be immersed in the book completely. And I think the book does, for the most part, a very, very good job in creating this world that you as a reader, that you as an, a, a young reader at that time, would have loved to fall in love with. And if I was a kid reading this, that I yeah, I would never have put that book down. That oh, probably yeah. would have and been I think one of my the, favorite books. I think the fact that it's targeted toward the younger audience, in addition to the fact that this is supposed to uh, represent that uh, blossoming, blossoming of imagination mm -hmm. and the connection that the reader has with the text, uh, those are reasons that this book doesn't have to have, doesn't have to seek perfection in, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, in not being predictable, uh, because there were elements that were, yeah. but mm -hmm. I think that they were able to, uh, uh, patch up those flaws with, uh, great senses of, uh, Brilliance. I liked too that I felt like it moved uh, quickly it had in a sort of excellent way. Excellent pacing. It like wasn't too fast. It, just, it wasn't too slow. Yeah, and no. you didn't stay on one subject for too long. Yeah. And I liked that. And I mean, not so much as an adult. I'm trying to look at it as how I would have liked it as a child. Because if you're reading a book as a child and you're on the same subject for a hundred pages, you're like, I'm over this. Whereas this, it's like, and then he went to the mountains, and then he went to the desert, and then he was in the ocean, and then there was this, and then there, there was, was that. Just and I'm like, description oh, for it to okay. be engaging without yeah. it being like monotony of every tiny little mm -hmm. detail. Yeah. And, he, and got that, a, he got enough out of each place. Absolutely, too. Yeah. and substantial in that sort of like. Just right. enough for you to be able to give your imagination that like little push in the right direction. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think when you when you're an adult rereading a children's book or reading for the first time a children's book, there's two important things to keep in mind. You have to suspend your your disbelief. You have to you have to put aside, like looking for explanation behind mm -hmm. the things that happen because oh, in children's books <laughs> kids don't need that. And then you have to realize that things move at a much quicker pace because children can't hold the attention span like adults can. Exactly. So things have to move quickly and they have to be And that's what I think I, I think... liked about it because it's like I'm just thinking like as a child I remember like getting into books like I loved Harry Potter. Harry Potter moved yeah. at least so, you know in the, the, in the earlier first, ones yeah. it moved and I was like okay I'm in fifth grade I can keep up with this like this mm -hmm. is great. Whereas like as you know, I got older and wanted more detail. Those books it was got there. more detail. Yeah. So this is, I think it's great for, um, you know, younger kids in that where they're reading like their first chapter books and, mm. you know, they're getting a little bit of the detail, but there's enough fantastical things mm. in it to keep you involved and the pace is good to keep the child engaged. I Something, think it's great. Oh, sorry. Something, I did oh. make the, oh, sorry. I did make the, uh, <laughs> <Who's next? laughs> I, I was, I wanted to add on to something that Kayla said about uh, the need to uh, suspend your uh, disbelief. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea, I think that the best works of children's literature are those that can uh, entertain all audiences. The same applies yeah. for uh, film and television. Uh, if you can't, if you can only entertain that that audience. one uh, uh, median audience, uh, I don't think that you're doing uh, your job. Uh, Properly, that's like Arlene Sardine. The only people that that would be able to entertain are uh, fourth graders that uh, are cynical about 
all things that are younger entertainment and have a sense of uh, cynicism in their mind as far as uh, uh, their sarcasm and uh, their transitioning. Uh, and only the people that uh, see things as a joke. So. Yeah, I, I kind of juxtaposed this book um, when we read A Wrinkle in Time. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. And I was thinking, thinking like, time. what I thought was very interesting was this held my attention and it didn't, it didn't belittle the... Um, reader by mm -hmm. saying well it was magic or it was god um you know it was it, everything was explained and there was this lovely like little wink and a nod at the audience every so often that was not only like the book nodding it's you know tipping its cap to the reader but it was also like the author tipping like so it was not only like breaking that fourth wall it's breaking the fourth wall of the fourth wall yeah. so it wasn't mm. talking to just bastion the yes, reader it was talking to mm. you the reader yeah this book so, was very meta that's what very, i very and very meta. i absolutely love that kind of yeah. stuff that plays with the material yeah. so that way it's like a well this person reading it even now and maybe that person who's reading it sometime in the future is yeah. going to be reading this and it's that that mm. never-ending loop of you know the mirror within the mirror within the mirror and i love um, that that comparison to the like what what do you see when you put a mirror to a mirror like what is there that's this that's and it's story, like it's yeah. the never ending <clears throat> story and I, I did kind of the same thing comparing it to a wrinkle in time where like you said I felt like in a wrinkle in time as we read through it it was like like you said just belittling it's like you hush know, move along yeah, yeah, yeah like just if just Wonderland go, just was go. more like, serious yeah, and a like wrinkle like in time was a better book mm -hmm. and less rushed yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then that would be the never ending story yeah. of um there's this tiny, so that book kind of is the first book that came to mind. The other one was um, Dante's Inferno. There is this really interesting section where, you know, Bastion becomes, you know, um, later in the, in the book when he's starting to run the out land of his of the wishes. Old emperors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he wanders into the land of the old emperors and he starts following um, the Arjak, know, the monkey. Yeah, mm -hmm. all these different locations where it's like, well, you got to go through all of these ordeals and these mm. trials and tribulations to be able to get where you want, and the only way through hell, the only way out of hell is through it. Through and it, yeah. that's kind of what okay. made me think of it. It was it was a different yeah. kind of journey, though, because uh, I felt that the uh, uh, the way that Dante's Inferno was uh, set <laughs> up, it was more negative, 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 I mean, positive, positive, hell, positive. So. Yeah, yeah, it was well. part of, hell was, hell was <laughs> negative, hell negative, negative, pretty negative. But I the hate Purgatorio to and Perdiso. <laughs> yeah, but, but this one was a bit because first he was uh, he went to the uh, that uh, the more nurturing uh, woman's house, the House of Change, that House of Change. Mm -hmm. Then he went to the Sea of Mist. Then he went to uh, yours, uh, the mine with all of the. I liked that part. That part, Rich. for some reason, really resonated. And then with me, he and finished at he finished at the uh, that, that the water. Fit. You want to know what character I liked was, that I feel like I wasn't supposed to like? And I, for the life of me, I can't remember the name. At the very beginning, when Atreyu um, was like trying going on his quest, and he goes to the. City of the Spooks, I think it was, yes, it was and, and, the, and the werewolf. Yeah. I loved that character. I was so, yeah, I was he was so a very him. jaded character, and you but I loved felt for him so much. And I was like, mm -hmm. I like, like you. And then he, leg. even <laughs> when he bit his leg, I was like, the poor thing's just trying to do his job. Like, oh, oh no, he's <laughs> dead. He's <laughs> trying to do his job. <laughs> I was like, I'll so be honest sad about Atreyu. I felt that in the first part of the story, Atreyu, to me, played off like a plot device. Oh, that's exactly yeah, that's a, yeah. In, the, in the second okay, part, was. I thought, while he was, I think ah, that he was I a much more... I understand why Larry does this now. I literally just pulled a Larry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> while I feel that Atreyu... Larry. <laughs> I mean, Atreyu was always a plot device, but I think that he was more... I think he gained his dimension the more that he started playing that's, off on Bastion. That's the whole point, because the first part of the story is the... That was the hook. That was mm, the part that of is getting... That story. Yeah, that, yeah, it's his story. And kind of like if you look at a, a video game with first-person point of view, you're inserting yourself as the person who's the, the character. You're the protagonist. Mm. So Atreyu, in the very beginning of the story, is kind of little more than just a pair of shoes and a mm. camera 
pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. He is nothing more than just a vehicle. He has no thoughts, he has no feelings. Precisely. And and that's why when you meet the childlike Empress, and she Mm kind of moves more towards trying to get Bastion in, and it becomes more and more evident that Bastion is the character that is getting, you know, the human child from beyond the veil. Oh, I love when they, Uh, from pages 177 to 180, where that interaction is going on. I loved that. I was laughing. The fact that that he was, what if, what if she thinks that I'm all ugly and flabby and And Atreus is like, I have another question. Uh, What if she thinks he's ugly? (laughs) (laughs) That whole entire thing, that whole play with, you know, um, the, again, the meta look at, you know, Mm -hmm. part, Mm -hmm. the, the wink and the nod at the, the camera Mm -hmm. is just, I think that's Mm -hmm. what made it so enjoyable as an adult, because that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff is very childlike in the way that like puppet shows are when they're uh-huh. interacting with the audience but it's also a very smart intelligent way of including the audience member in it it's, because it's it's that multiple layers of we're including the you know bastion in on this level but we're also including the readers in on this level and i think that's what made that in the in the long run i will have to say this though the book could have ended like 70 pages shorter. Yes. We got to yes. the end and it was like, and then he ran through and then it was with his dad and then this happened and yes. I was like, okay, we get I it. Like, I, think, yeah. I think but... the way that, I was, I liked the way it ended. I, I think there was the... enough. Oh, no, 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 don't get me wrong. I loved the way it ended. I loved the whole entire thing from start mm-hmm. to finish, but I feel like there were, like, you could have taken you 70 out pages out bit. and maybe mm-hmm. it was just because I was an adult reading it mm-hmm. at two o'clock. But um, <laughs> there, it was still was it a, a this morning. Wonder- <laughs> no, <laughs> it was yesterday morning. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you keep your mouth shut. Way. Way. I, I can <laughs> shut your mouth. Has anybody has anybody seen the uh, the film adaptation? Oh yeah. Here's You're the not. wild thing. I have, and I didn't realize it. I've seen the first and the second. The parts that I was remembering were from the second movie. Mm, because the first movie, it. If they, the first movie was set up so that uh, it ended after his interaction with the childlike empress. Mm-hmm. He just took the dragon, got revenge on his bullies, and then went on his own adventures. If it, the way that that right. ended, it made it look like Bastion, Bastion was the hero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The first part, and a little bit into the second part, also denotes that. He's mm-hmm. the hero of Fantastica. In this piece, it is more so Bastion, uh, he uh, seeks, uh, whether he wants to or not, is seeking an epiphany. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's maturation. Yeah, it's the whole idea. It's that I, it's what Fantastica and the Never Ending Story stand for. That it's idea what, of immersing yourself yeah. in imagination, and while you can still uh, maintain that sense of imagination, develop the... Uh, sense of uh, better uh, morals. It's using that to gain confidence in yourself. Yes. And I think that's what uh, Wrinkle in Time attempts to do and yeah. doesn't really ultimately accomplish because, there again, it's the, you know, shoo-shoo, don't ask these questions sort of um, disquiet, like disquieting narrative. That of, ending was you know, a cop-out. Yeah, yeah. There, is, there is a lot of Shenanigans. Yeah. So you know, it kind of reminds me of I think the I think the movie is from his Batman that quote that's like you either die a hero or you live long long enough to see yourself become the villain. Mm-hmm. And I think that you can kind of see Bastion becoming like an anti-hero towards the end. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way of putting it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know about exactly t- toward the end. I I think he begins. I think at the point where he wishes to be uh, dangerous and feared. Yeah, he develops yeah. that sense of arrogance, but I don't. I I don't think there was. While I think that the things he did were uh, undesirable, I don't can't say that I felt sorry for him because after everything he has felt, he's working himself. He's uh, working his way through his emotions. Yeah, he lived his entire life as the yeah. underdog, and now he was given literally, yeah. you know. What is that, Razatob? Uh, a clean slate yeah. um, mm-hmm. and unlimited power, and, yeah. and told that you are alone, the hero and the savior, and you know that keeps on getting um, echoed throughout the entire land. How can you not feel afraid of that? Like, yeah. everybody's a little over the top. And that's what Arin yeah. and his uh, loss of memories uh, stand for, because I think that anybody can uh, 
Uh, I think that it's the whole idea that once you obtain everything that you want, uh, you begin to uh, lose a sense of you, who you are, mm -hmm. both good and bad, or Absolutely. who you were. Yeah. I feel like he kind of foreshadows that a little bit in the beginning when he says, like, you know, you wish for something, and then when you're presented with it, um, mm -hmm. are you sure you really want it? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I saw, like, I, I questioned that a little bit when I got to it, but then I understood it a little bit more towards the end. Like, okay, this, like, he... It was foreshadowing. It was like uh, that's the only the best way I can say it. Yeah. That he just you Losing know, and it self. kind of makes you think like, okay, all these things that you've ever wished for, if you ever got them, like, how would you handle it? Would you do it differently than he did? Like, yeah. if you were like you said, the underdog, or you know, being uh, picked on all the time, running away from your bullies and hiding in a bookstore, and then yeah. here you're handed this, and you can do anything with it. Can you really blame him for wanting to know what it feels like to not? be him anymore mm -hmm. so i don't know i felt like that it it help, it can help make the reader of the younger readers kind of you know really think about who they are and who they want to be mm -hmm. um and how they want to become who yeah. they want to be it's, and a, it, it's mm -hmm. a good moral lesson yes. is buried very smartly in mm -hmm. a wonderful tale yes. mm -hmm. that incorporates the reader in such a wonderful way that it doesn't feel like it's teaching you a lesson. Mm -hmm. It's taking you along on yeah. this story and showing you the what ifs in this marvelous wink and a nod at the mm -hmm. camera, like I've said before. Yeah. And I think one of my favorite ways of it is, well, and that's another story to tell right. for another time. I was going to bring and that up. Usually, that. usually I can't I stand that. when they don't finish particular stories, but I think that the way uh, End uh, did it in here was yeah, just yeah. so. Uh, a cute I think little he, perk. He, yes. Yeah, it was so clever and I think that it was necessary that mm -hmm. the particular characters uh, they told you whatever you needed to know about them but that was that uh, another mm -hmm. character that I really de uh, really uh, developed an interest in uh, was uh, uh, Carl Conrad uh, Coriander the, oh, yeah. uh, the bookstore Coriander owner cool. yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Was he reading the Neverending Story, or was he writing it? I can't remember. He was remember. reading it. When, he, yes, was, he was yeah, reading when it. Opening it. it. Yeah. I kept thinking about that when because... he stole it. Yes, okay, because so, I thought I but remembered... in the end, he somewhere. actually, it turned out he didn't steal it because uh, the book it was, was, no, it was never right. hit. Yeah. He, he did engage in a similar adventure, and he has said that plenty of other people have engaged in a similar adventure, but... And I think that that's, I think that discussion that the two of them had really begins to develop your great appreciation of uh, who he is as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, that's what I was like trying to make sure I understood because I thought yeah, it I said somewhere that, that he wrote it but that, or no, that he, he was, was writing it. it. But no. I was like, I could have mm. swore he said he was reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I like, I, th I got a little confused there. And, I was, and then of course, you know, as I'm reading through it, I'm like, wait, what if he never took this book? How would it be different if, you know, the store owner was reading it? And, and that's what like, I was that, I was thinking too. that the like, whole does time. It, does it present mm -hmm. as a different book to every reader? Mm -hmm. I would like to think so. Yeah. yeah and that's I would like to think every so single too. person's imagination it, is a little it bit is different. It is what you need it to be. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it needs to be that, that catalyst in some way or another, and other people will be interested far easier or, you know, uh, kind of tugged on a little more in a different direction to convince you that you are the savior, you are the individual being talked about in that book. Right. So It also made me wonder, too, it's like, is that the only copy? Or are there other copies <coughs> out there in other bookstores I think that other people are reading, too? Are everywhere there hundreds? in the yeah. one spot <laughs> like, at one point and, and it just, it brought up so many, like... And this is why I love the yeah, book! Yeah, it was, like, a lot of questions. It's, with the, it's <laughs> the way, it, it really quantum takes, cat it takes fantasy and spins it on its head. Schrodinger's cat? Yeah. 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 Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I, I think like the that. nice thing about that, whereas, like, other things that kind of twist on these emotions, as other things are like, well, you'll just never know the answer. But the never-ending story in itself is the answer. It yes. is the unending story. It's, it is everywhere. It's, or it or is every it's the two yeah. snakes, you know, yes. with each other's yep. tail. That was that um, was the one thing that like got me. Like when he was explaining, it's like, oh well, here's something you need to know about Fantasca. No matter where you are, everything is near and far. And I'm like, what? Yeah, very, yeah. very <laughs> like how? Yeah. In the way that it, it kind of made it, well, Did, you know, when was, I was, I was, was your Rover age, was playing I, in your head when? Uh, well, I no, was it was that? it was. <laughs> It was just, I was, that was the point where I was like, all right, I need to seriously stop trying to understand this book and just go with it. Because at that point, I was like, they, you can be walking for days or you can walk for an hour and you'll end up in the same spot. And I'm like, 
What? <laughs> my, only, my only request for this, I think, would have been to have that information to me sooner. Like, yeah, like, like a quarter of the way through the book, or yes. three, yeah. two that thirds was, of the way through Because that was my moment where I was like, stop looking for reasoning, because clearly there is none. Yeah. <laughs> like, I that think, was but, that. <laughs> I think if there was one part that was a bit of a slog, it was that uh, when you first went into uh, uh, Fantastica, the, the mm -hmm. characters that they introduced at the beginning that you really didn't get any sense of. Oh, yeah, the, like the, um, the, Night Hob, the Will of the Wisp and stuff. The Will of the yeah. Wisp, yeah. Uh, the one that, uh, that was the, the, little... the rock eater. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, See, I liked that. But it I makes really liked that. They I were really making their way flavor. to the same yeah. destination, yeah. but you never seen them again. Yeah. I I actually also liked the mentions of, um what, what was it, the Wandering Mountain, how they're talking about, like, what are those, like, ice things that it takes them years to take a single step in centuries and they think they're watching somebody go Pew! yeah exactly <laughs> and i was just like i'm like could you imagine like moving so slowly that it takes you a whole year to take one step in like way, this oh my makes god me think of um <laughs> it, in a, a positive spin of it uh like creepy pastas or those yeah those, um there's there's a word for it not a tupola um, cause that's like a specific cultural thing. These are stories that are created like, like that are in legends almost? Explain, no, again, those have history. These are stories that are said to have history and yet they are thought up on the spot. So oh, okay. there's a term for that and I can't remember what it is, but it doesn't matter. I we'll trust you that there's a term. Yeah, there's yeah, an actual, there's an actual term for it and then I can't remember what it is. The only thing that I can think of is, um, the Slender Man idea, but that's that's mm -hmm. basically the only thing that I can think of. And where that's it's a story to... for another time. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? Yes, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Moving right along, but long story short, I'm done. That's me. Already done. Ending what I was rambling about. Do we uh, we have any final thoughts? I think we said it all. I think it's a, a lovely read that no matter which age you find yourself at, <laughs> um, there's something that will catch your interest in, interest in there. Um, I strongly urge you to find it and read it. Mm. Yeah, it's a fun reminder to that sometimes you still need to exercise that imagination. That's good. Mm. With yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like that. And I, I mean, just remember being a child. Too. Yeah, like like you said, not just exercising your imagination, but go back to a time where everything was just whimsical and fun. The sky's and the limit. yes, exactly. The sky's the limit. Like just have that imagination. And I mean, I think this book did a really great job with, you know giving you enough, but, I mean, when I pictured those rock people talking all slow and <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> like, that's, but, I mean, like, I didn't have to hear it. I <coughs> heard it in my head. I'm like, like, it came to life a little bit and, you know, kept me engaged as if, once, once I let go of that whole near and far thing, then I was like, okay, I get this now. Mm. Um, and as long as you go into it, you know, not looking for reasoning, then you, I think it's a really enjoyable it's an book. Easy book to get lost. The, way that I, yeah. I, the first thing I wrote about it is that uh, Never Ending Story is a story that speaks for all of us. Uh, yes. It's a one that uh, the ones that can't fit in, the readers, the flawed, the flabby, the insecure, the thinkers, the dreamers, those that want it all but learn and realize that everything is nothing. Beautiful Dang. poetic, right? He's that a was very good. I yeah. liked that. And uh, how do we want to rate it on a 0 to 5 scale with half stars permitted? I'm giving it a 5. I think it does everything that it set out, sets out to do brilliantly. Um, it doesn't coddle the reader, but conversely, it doesn't, uh, you know, chastise, chastise, I can't talk, I'm sorry, chastise them for having that sort of childlike curiosity of the world, and it encourages you to be able to... At, whatever age you find yourself reading this book, um, be a little more imaginative and to do so with a kindness in the world that you live in. So I think it does that brilliantly. So five stars. I'd give it a five too. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this as an adult, let alone if I would have as a child. Yeah. I'm going to go with a four just because um, there were a couple things that, you know, like kind of looking back on it, uh, I know, like, with children, you're supposed to use, like, bigger words to encourage their vocabulary, but I felt like there were, you know, some parts where, like, no child is ever going to know what that means, or, uh, and, like, just kind of, like, even as an adult, I don't know what that means. I have to look it up. Um, and then there, like I said, just as an adult, I'm sure I would probably would have appreciated it more as a child, um, as much fun as it was, um, like, I'm always kind of looking 
kind of for those reasonings and until like you said a quarter into the book when I finally was like you know what forget forget reasoning I can't just sit back then and enjoy. then I got <laughs> to enjoy it a little bit more um if it had come sooner guess what I probably would have enjoyed it a little bit sooner um but overall I enjoyed the book I would say four stars maybe this is a good opportunity to teach a child how to use a dictionary that too <laughs> yes <laughs> I learned on my own but you know <laughs> I'm just playing around with different numbers I was uh contemplating toward four and a half and five, but I ultimately went with five because I think that this uh, does everything that it needs to in order to uh, create the sense of uh, fantasy, but at the same time make it as relatable and authentic. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's uh, one of the best books that I've read that is able to quench the uh, desires of a reader and their passion. And I think that this is a, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, a reader's goal. You saying that made me think of that. Very few books have I read where it's like, uh, I'm satisfied with how it ends. I'm, there aren't too many questions aside from wondering Coriander's story. I kind of, mm. it was, it did, like I said, it did its job. So, you know, like once I put the book down, I was like, ah, okay. I'm good. And it's you know? unapologetically whimsical. Like, you don't, yes. you don't find yourself, like, yes. thinking, like, oh, God, I feel so stupid for reading about these wandering mountains and, you know, these luck dragons and stuff. I, at, no, at no point did I feel like I'm too old for this. No, there's mm -hmm. in absolutely no way the book is um, unapologetic, unabashedly just fun. Yeah. Um, and it does so in a way that it's the perfect balance between real-world reality seriousness um, and, but playful in all of the right ways. Um, so that very few books do that. I kind of want to add it, like now that you guys are talking about one other thing that I thought of going back because you know we all read a, uh, a Wrinkle in Time, as well, and you know <clears throat> For some every, reason that I, book was the, the it really was a head. good yeah. like comparison. Yeah. Um, and the way that I saw, I found uh, Bastion like <coughs> as a kid relatable more so than um and Meg. I, yes, thank you. Like she just seemed very. Uh, like too headstrong for a child, too stubborn into this and to that. Whereas Bastion's just like, that's a normal child. Uh, actually, kind of re also reminded me of um, the kid in um, uh, the ocean at the end of the lane. How you know the child is just an ordinary, kid an with ordinary an kid. extraordinary story. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> and how you just expect him to act this way because that's how a child would act. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like, and that's what I liked about it. It's like nothing too crazy, nothing like over the top and it's just like a normal kid living this wonderful adventure and doing these amazing things. I think like, it's important to have a, a central character that is likable or at least likeable. relatable or has some kind of uh, a sense of understanding if you're supposed to whether you're supposed to like them or mm. you're supposed to notice their flaws but still be able to understand them uh, and uh, I also found it interesting it was uh, Bastion was uh, questioned uh, what the one time that he questioned in class uh, whether or not Jesus has to use the bathroom. Yes, no, that's, I thought that's that such a, a child. It, it, like, if you are interested in uh, picking up the uh, Neverending Story, uh, here is uh, my copy, probably the most familiar copy. Uh, it was uh, translated by Ralph Mannheim uh, from German into English, and uh, I. Definitely hope and beseech uh, that you check this out. And be sure to join us next time for another episode of Literary Gladiators. For now, keep reading. Bye, Mom.